Hello and welcome. It's the chat. I am Manny. My guest on the program is quite an amazing person. Now, when he was a boy, he used to follow his father into the forests to look for herbs. As a native doctor, the father was a native doctor. He used to go with him looking for herbs for medical cure. Dr. Godwin Maduka is a Nigerian-American medical doctor, businessman and philanthropist, founder and former director of the Las Vegas Pain Institute and Medical Center. Born 1959 in Anambra State, Maduka began his education in Nofia Comprehensive Secondary School and All Saints Grammar School, Umunze. He got admission to study medicine at the University of Port Harcourt, but couldn't continue due to financial constraints. In 1982, with the help of a friend and his younger sibling, he seized the opportunity and moved to the United States of America upon getting a scholarship to study at Rust College. He graduated with a first class and shortly after was offered a scholarship to study pharmacy at Mercer University, graduating in 1988. After graduation, he had a brief stint as a pharmacy technician at the Veterans Administration Hospital in Atlanta, Georgia after which he received a full scholarship to study medicine at the University of Tennessee, where he completed his internship and graduated in 1993. Unstoppable, Maduka's insatiable quest for knowledge led him to Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center for his postgraduate training and residency in anesthesiology, critical care and pain management, graduating in 1997. Upon graduation, Maduka moved to Las Vegas, worked for some years, and in 1999 founded the Las Vegas Pain Institute and Medical Center. The success of the institute gave birth to other locations in Southern Nevada. He is a clinical faculty supervisor and adjunct professor of pain management and anesthesiology at Toro University, Nevada. He is also a clinical assistant professor of surgery at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas School of Medicine. Dr. Godwin Maduka is a philanthropist who continues to invest in human capital development, empowering women and youths of his community in Anambra State, and he is married with children. You heard my story. Is there anything wrong with what I just said about you? No, you're right in what you said. Let's even go back to your early days. What, you know, made you lose your father's footsteps at that time and change your mind from traditional medicine into full medicine? It's, it's interesting. Even up to now, I don't think I changed my mind because I still incorporate my father's uh, ways of doing medicine. The only thing is uh, most of the medications uh, healing we have now is no more by native doctors, is mostly uh, being rendered by medical doctors. So the decision to uh, seek uh, medical education is to make it authentic. What my father been doing is still the same principle of healing, but the psychology of it, and the approach to the patients, and uh, the end the result when I was with him, is about going to the a bush and get the roots, the leaves of fruits where they have some healing properties, and no matter the air bent, and then coming back and preparing them in the form that you will administer to the patient. So when I was in pharmacy school, I studied pharmacognosy, which is the study of plants as a means of treatment, as a pharmaceutical uh, uh, part of treating a patient. So you can see my father's uh, 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 career as a native doctor is still in me, but expanded to this Western okay. medicine. Western medicine. Yes. 
you had to travel to acquire Western medicine yes. or Western education, so yes. to speak. Where did you go to? Well, when I left here in 82, I traveled to Mississippi. I was saying to you before we came to you know mm -hmm. this point that way back then in the 80s, early 80s, there was a young man called Andrew. Mm -hmm. We all know his name, Enebili, you know, who got so frustrated about the economic situation in Nigeria and decided to leave Nigeria by saying, I'm checking out. Mm -hmm. That was in 1982. Mm -hmm. Did it influence you? Well, you see, uh, Andrew should have worked 39 check out. <laughs> because, you know, 82 was still better than now. Yeah. But even the only thing that we might not have had in 82 is some of the amenities. But people were comfortable. We might not have access to education, but now we don't have a lot. So it influenced me a little bit, but what influenced me is a lack of fund to continue education, which is going to uh, uh, America. That's why I studied chemistry, thinking that I would get into medicine. But even after I finished chemistry, I still needed some more classes to qualify me to get into medicine. So I went to do a doctorate in pharmacy before getting into medical school, after which I went to Harvard. So... What Andrew said in 82 is right, but it hasn't so things have gotten worse in Nigeria since 82. So this is the time to check out. But I checked in to see what I can do. Well, well let's say since 1982, <laughs> mm -hmm. you left this country. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. Have you, have you become, been back since after then? No, what happened is I left in 82. I think I came back in 93. Uh, to do tropical medicine in a Baptist Memorial Hospital next to Wari uh, and the Lorraine. Um, that's when I came back, after about 12, 11, 12 years. Uh, then I went back and did my training at Harvard. And uh, after that, I had been coming home regularly since after graduation from Boston. Mm. Mm -hmm. Does it have anything to do with this concept of uh, the Las Vegas Pain Institute? Yes, yeah, so I founded the Las Vegas Pain Institute in 1999. I finished from Harvard University in my training as an anesthesiologist and pain management and critical care and moved to Las Vegas. Worked for a year and a half for another company. And in 1999, I established the Las Vegas Pain Institute which he has six medical centers today. What, what do you think about the state of health care in Nigeria? Well, I think anybody in the street of Nigeria can even answer that question. Uh, it's really bad for the population of two, close to 200 million people. And I still believe that we, uh, everybody needs to look into it. Individuals should be uh, encouraged to invest in healthcare, I still believe that the federal government and state level should invest in healthcare, not just in the treatment, but also in the research. And that will change the course of uh, problem in healthcare we have in Nigeria. Every region in the world have what they have that is mostly the, the problem they have. I was here in Nigeria, malaria will come first. Type for the second, and all that parasite, parasite infections, and all that tropical diseases that we people that are living under this tropic should be able to do research. In. But it will seem as so far in Nigeria we have been able to contain the malaria epidemic and um, other tropical such tropical diseases as you mentioned. In America, there's, you know, there's a COVID-19 pandemic that's all over the world. Yet many more people are dying from America than they are in, in, in Nigeria. What do you think is responsible for that? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I live in both places. But uh, to answer that quickly, I had to tell you malaria is not contained. The only time malaria will be contained is when you eliminate all the mosquitoes. Any research into malaria infestation have to deal for uh, deal with mosquitoes. I think it's time, and that's why some of us are going to get into it. 
where we have to bring away or spraying the mosquitoes without affecting the individuals and eliminating forever. Do you think that is possible? Why not? It was possible. Because if you know the DNA of the mosquito and you have to get the chemicals or insecticides that would add to that, that would kill mosquitoes without killing human beings or the animals. What's your experience, personal experience, at the time you heard of this COVID-19? No, so because many... there were many more people dying from America than they were dying you know, from Nigeria. It's still happening too. Is that why you came back? Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I came back. So the answer to that is that Nigerians were able to contain the disease quickly because they are afraid. They contained it. The most people, uh, when they say shut down, they really shut down. But in America, uh, we still believe that we can get the cure quickly. Uh, we, we believe that at some point this will be contained. But it's a, a tricky disease. So the reason most people dying in America, I believe, is because we didn't take it as serious. Because we believe we were superpower. We could have always contained this. Well, people like in Nigeria, they shut down and stopped some of the people living overseas, like us, from coming home for over nine months. And the disease was contained. But in America, it was not, never really contained because people never really had that complete shutdown. And they were in following the principle of mask, social distancing. And the places in America where they observed that, they very low. Do you think that... Finally, they have found a cure for it. With the introduction of the vaccine that mm. has been made use of in uh, I think time America. Would, yeah, I think time will tell. I mean, there are so many things about this disease that is still less understood. But it's a tricky virus. And uh, to get vaccine for it is also still difficult. But there's uh, some vaccine now, and we're going to see how many people that got vaccine never get the disease. That will prove the effectiveness of it. And that means it will be eliminated all over the world, eventually. But for now, it's ravaging the economy of the U.S., ravaging the health of the people, and it's all over the place. Over here in Nigeria, the percentage of infection has gone so low. And nobody, I mean, there are still people have it, but it's not as bad as in the Western world. You seem to be... A grassroots man. You prefer to live in Nigeria than abroad? Oh my God, that's where I was born. I didn't leave this, this land until I was about 22 years to go to the U.S. I love the country. I and you have lived in the U.S. since then for over 40 years. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. America is still a beautiful place to be. They gave me what I could have gotten in Nigeria is one of the most civilized... Uh, what did they give you? Well, they gave me education. They gave me Western ideas. They gave me the best way to have interpersonal and intrapersonal skills. They just produce a champion in, in me. Have you been able to put that into use in your own country? Oh, yes. Because America is a place where they're very good in giving out uh, things where you you value of your life is how you treat your neighbors and how you contribute. So after finishing medical school and finish my training at Harvard in ninety seven and ninety eight I took off and I've been doing philanthropy at my hometown, showing them the way to really treat one another, taking away things that don't make sense. What do you do in that sense? Well I, I especially in my neighborhood of Umuchuku, I was able to, you know, help them with construction of roads. At least we have motorable roads. I was able to help the widows with the housing. Because before I left, the people still have a lot of touchy houses and they use toilet outside. Those people now, they have uh, homes with the in-house uh, toilet and the in-house parlors and four or five bedrooms, okay, so that when it rains, they don't have to worry. You understand? And most of them are boreholes and things like that, just to mirror what I'm used to over there. 
We also make sure that we have a place of worship uh, for religious denomination. Are you a Christian? Yeah, I'm a Christian. Take a question from me and read the question and answer the question yourself. Okay, I'm opening it. It says, say you were in leadership role in Nigeria today. How would you have handled the NSAX protests or any other agitation for good governance? That's a very good question. Is it? Yeah, it really is. Where were you during the NSAX protests? Actually, in America, lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so when, how would you have handled it? Yeah, I will talk to the youth. I will get them. Because it started as non-violent. We should get... That's what other modernized countries do. I talk to them, like your child. If your child will come and complain to you about something, do you just ignore him? You will make him mad. So whatever they complain, and they had a legitimate reason. They, they feel like they're being assaulted and insulted and humiliated by that group of police. Okay? I built police station and division uh, in my home. We never told him to go. You, and you built police stations. Yeah, in your div hometown. division of police headquarters. Are there a lot of criminals in your home. No, it's just to prevent. Well, there are criminals everywhere, but <laughs> I, I needed to be safe when I come home. Okay? okay, and you know sometimes I come home with expatriates, so the children should have been approached. They should have been approached, and they should have done it in a democratic way, and talk to them, and say we have heard you, so don't worry, we're going to take steps. That's what I would have done. Instead of ignoring them and it led to the points where some of them were shot. Now, being approached could be from even religious leaders, could be from groups in the community, could be from the governors or the president. It doesn't have to be government only. So this youth should have been addressed right away. Because one good thing about that movement is that it has no ethnicity to it. All the use of Nigeria was involved. And that should be in a particular time or unification of this country to address them as a group. That chance was missed. Do you think the government has taken the right steps? Well, obviously it's not going on anymore, so uh, I think there's some mistake made. But I think government stepped in quickly. To, there was a lot of conversations too, from even from police to these youths. A lot of people got involved, and the government too got involved. Uh, to, uh, especially when it, it got the attention of international community. I think they, many, later on, uh, were able to do what they should have done at the beginning, and that's why uh, that is okay now. But. We will never allow that to happen again. So we need to How change. How can you stop that from happening? Well, we need to change the country. How would you change well, it? How would you change the country? Start by the ideas and what needs to be done. We need to create a job for the youth. We need to keep our money here in Nigeria. Okay, instead of trying to other nations that don't necessarily need us to come over there. If the amount of money you use to buy property in, in other countries, you can use it to train about 1,000 youths. Are you thinking of returning to Nigeria permanently someday? I already did. You have? Yes. You're back home now? Yeah, I'm home. <laughs> I'm home, and it's a beautiful thing. Yes, I retired from medicine about uh, a month or so ago, and my nephew, who I trained uh, from college to medical school, did exactly what I did, and the specially, uh, specially course that I did, and he's taking over my uh, medical centers, six of them. So what are you going to be doing now in your retirement? Well, what I do now is, you see, I've been involved with philanthropy uh, for many years, and that's what sustains me, okay? Just giving? Uh, giving, and the building, like I said, the building things, in every, every aspect of life, from religion to industry to youth and women empowerment to um, just plain getting along. Who do you miss most now that you're away 
is it your family or do you have a wife? Yes. And children? Uh, yeah, I have five children. So, so they're all American exports? Yes, they're all in America now. I mean, they're still in America, they're all in schools. So what do I miss now is, of course, my parents who have passed away and my immediate younger brother who actually gave me the money with which I went to America. He died uh, 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 tragically. He was run over by a tipper because of some altercation or the other. Uh, so those are the reasons I decided I had to come home because a lot of bad things are happening on this on this land. Let me see what I can do. It might take one person or two or three or four will change this nation. Okay, the value of life in Nigeria is lower than any other nation. Okay, I mean, people can be driving and looking at people going through rubbish and don't think anything about it. The Americans or the English people call it, call, cause it indifference. We should never be indifferent to human suffering. Now we're about to uh, send you on a castaway journey just to test your endurance for 10 days on an island. You alone with five things that you cannot do without for those 10 days. What would they be? I will have my Bible as a source of inspiration. Do you read the Bible? I read the Bible, mostly the Psalms. Okay. Then I will um, also get some food uh, that I can uh, don't need to heat up. Then I will also take me a blanket, a big one though, that I can wrap myself all over. So, so even to if keep it warm. Yeah, not only that, even if snake come here, we think I'm a log of wood and just go over me. You know what I mean? I will also take along with me, of course, a pair of shoes that I will have. And then the last thing I will take, of course, I will have my clothes and, and, the, and the shoes. Then the last thing I will take is, um, uh, the last thing I will take is a uh, fluid to rehydrate, okay? Those, but he never even said, should I carry them? Maybe I'm carrying them in a wheelbarrow. So I will just get enough to sustain all those. Remember in my Bible, there will be a chaplet inside it. They still consider the religious things. And some quotations, I put them all between the Bible. So I think with those five, I can even survive a month. Are you satisfied with your life as it is right now? <sighs> or is there anything you want to change? You know... My life then is no more mine. In my life used to be mine. So, but being a Christian, my life is not mine anymore. My life is everybody's around me, my neighbors, because when they hurt, I really hurt. When the country suffers, we will suffer. So, personally, oh, I've been to the on top of the mountain. I never expected it to be up there. But in terms of satisfaction, I'm not. Because to me, existence is not person, it's not one person. We call it individualism. But in generally, I will be satisfied when the the value of life in this country and the way we respect each other and the way we are well developed, more literate. Because a literate nation is a very literate and healthy nation is a wealthy nation where people can discuss anything because they have equivalent uh, education, equivalent exposure, so that you can have good narrative and good conversations. Dr. Godwin Madoka, thank you so much. Thank you very for much. Being on the program. Thank you. It's been Dr. Godwin Maduka on The Chat this week. I am Manny. See you again. The Chat is produced by Channels Television. You can watch it again online. Just visit our social media platforms, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook.